Uh, so glad you're here today. Um, this past week, my daughter was home from college. Uh, she is going into her senior year at the University of Arkansas. So she was home for a little break. She'd been working all summer, doing an internship. Came home for a week. Uh, and we're all hanging out together as a family. We all go to dinner together. So she's there, and, and my wife, and, and then my son and daughter-in-law, and my granddaughter Collins, and we go to Yolanda's Tacos down in Castle Rock. It's amazing tacos if you've never been there. And so we're eating dinner, and in our family, it's very, uh, we, ha- we have a hard time like hiding our emotions. We wear our emotions on our sleeve. We all know where we stand. We have no poker face at all. And so everybody's going, what's wrong, Maddie? What's wrong? What's wrong? You're not yourself. You're not talking a lot. And she talks a lot. So that was not normal. And so she's just kind of quiet and looks a little bit, you know, down. And, and so after dinner, uh, we're driving, she and I, uh, we're in the same car together. And my uh, we drove separate cars to the restaurant. So we got to run by Walmart. And so we get in the car, we start to pull out and go, okay, what's going on? Lay it out for me. How are you feeling? What's, what's happening? And so we've been doing this since she was two. This is like a pro tip for young dads, okay, is that we don't start this when our kids are 22. We start it when they're little. And so every night when she would go to bed, I would kneel by her bed and pray for her, tell her she was my favorite little girly in the whole wide world. And then I would say, <laughs> and then I would say, what's going on? How was your day? And she got older and older and older. I would just say, is there anything on your heart, anything you need to talk about? So this is normal for us. And so we're driving. Hey, lay it out for me. And here's what she said. She said, I'm just uh, I'm feeling overwhelmed. Like I just, there's so much pressure on me to, to know what to do next. And you've probably been there before. Right? She's about to be a senior in college. And she's fast forwarding her life to May. And when I graduate, and where am I going to live? And, and I got to get a big girl job. And, 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 and I, I need to do my master's because she wants to be a counselor. She's like, I got to do my master's. And where should I apply? And is, am I going to live in this city or that city? And then it just devolves into, will I ever get married? I'm like, I don't uh, Yeah, I'm sure of it. You're gorgeous. And so anyway, we just have lots of conversations. She's actively looking, by the way, young men. We're taking applications. Uh, you only have 50 pastors to get through. It's not intimidating at all. Uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, but the whole point of that was, and you probably know, like this, this weight, this pressure of what do I do next? And so we have the, a long conversation, and I tried to help her map out a plan like a good dad, and I tried to alleviate some of that stress and say things like, you know, last summer you didn't know what you were going to be doing this summer, but it all turned out, right? And, and yeah, all those kinds of things. But then I left that conversation, and as I was laying in bed that night, I thought, I feel like she feels all the time. I feel anxious about the future. I'm always trying to look around the corner and see what's next. I feel pressure because the future is foggy, right? It's uncertain. And there's, there's a lot of fear behind that going, what do I do next? What do I, what do, I do this fall? What, what, do, what does my family, what does this church feel? You probably have some of those same feelings, right? Like, do, do I take this job? Do we move? What am I supposed to do with my life? What, the career that I'm in, I don't think it's for me. Do, do I stay with him? Do, do, do we take it to another level? Do, do my kids go to this school or that school? And we're just, we're living in the future. We're living sometimes months or years. Like, what's that going to be? How's that going to turn out? And if you're like me, that just kind of brings up some stress in our life. What's going to happen next month? What's going to happen in November? We know it's going to be so exciting here in the United States. It's going to be really, really calm, peaceful. Everybody's going to be unified, excited about the future together, right? So what's around the corner? So that's what we're going to talk about for the next few weeks here at Journey. How do you seek God for your future? How do you seek God for the next thing? And here's what I know is that every single one of us has a next thing. Every single one of us has a decision to make or what what is my life really supposed to be all about and how do I seek God for that? So that's what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks here at Journey. Today, a little bit unique in in that I'm going to give us some content, like a simple idea that we all can apply to our life about whatever you've got going on. 
because your decision, your next thing, it's incredibly unique from the person sitting beside you. They're, we're complex people. We've got lots of choices to make. But I want to give you just a way to look at that next decision. And then we're also going to talk today about what's next for us as a church. We're, it's kind of a vision Sunday, the next thing for journey. So we're going to try to do those two things together. So sound good? Uh, if it doesn't, I guess you could just leave. <laughs> so <laughs> turn it off if you're watching online, if you don't like that. So here, <laughs> it's good to be back, everybody. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm glad to be back. So uh, yeah, the, uh, the next thing uh, is the simple thing. The next thing in our lives is the simple thing. Now, I didn't say easy. Um, uh, I didn't say that it would be super, super clear, but it is simple. There's this idea all throughout the scripture that God invites us to this simple relationship with him and determining where we should go next. You probably read this verse along the way. If you grew up in church, you've been around church for a while. We even sang it today in one of our songs. Your word is a lamp before my feet and a light for my journey. Now imagine as they're writing uh, these words, there's no electricity. There's no lamp post. You're not flipping on a light. Um, and you've got a lantern or a lamp. And I know this is a very simple idea, but as you light a lantern or a lamp like this and you hold it up, as you take a step, it really only illuminates what? The next couple of steps, the next few feet in front of you. And so what he's saying is that your word, your truth, your presence, a relationship with you is, is like a lamp before my feet. As much as I would like to see way, way down the road, I really can only see what's right in front of me, a light for my journey. So I don't know about you, but like, I, I really would prefer that God's word be like one of these babies right here. Like, <laughs> it's not two or three feet in front of me. It's way, uh, some of you have flashlights like this, right? You can see Denver from Pueblo. You're like, yeah, there it is. <laughs> lighting up the sky. And so the, I, I like that. I, I would love for God to give me all the directions and the destination. How's this going to turn out just a few years from now? But the truth is, a relationship with God is a lot more like this. Truth is, stepping into the future is a lot more like this. How, how, how many of you are, are campers? Like you, you take a little lantern. I, I'm not a camper. I don't understand it at all. I'm, I'm a, my idea of camping is the Broadmoor. So I don't, <laughs> I don't get every time someone tells me about camping, it's like, yeah, we took and we bought all of this inside stuff to go outside. We spent $4,000 and then we went on our camping trip and it was amazing. People got snake bit and there was a flood and then we lost a kid. <laughs> You should come with us. No. <laughs> but you probably had this experience. Like you hold out the lamp and you can only see a few feet in front of you. All of us want to know what the next thing is. And this is just the truth. The next thing is almost always in our relationship with God is just one or two more steps. And then we learn to trust God. We trust our relationship with him and that he is guiding us along the way. And the closer that we get to him and we live a life of relationship with God, we wake up in the morning and we say, God, would you order my steps? Would you guide me? Would you lead me through this day? And we peer off into the future, but we can only see a few moves ahead. And then all God asks us to do is to just take the next step. Just take the next step in trust and obedience. What do you know to do? What is the right next step for you? Like when I was talking to my daughter, we were talking about, you know, hey, I don't know, like, where am I going to go to school? I'm like, well, we haven't applied to one yet. So what if the only thing that you know to do is to apply to that school? You can't control if you get accepted if you don't apply. That was a fun conversation. And, <laughs> but you see what I mean. It was just a simple next step along the way. We held up the, the lantern. And so as we hold the lantern in the presence of God and the truth of his word, and we take a step and we take another step, guess what happens? 
the next steps along the path, what? Get, get illuminated. And that's how a relationship with God often goes when we're seeking God in the future. Now, we're going to talk a lot about what, the, what does that look like practically in your life over the next few weeks. But today, I really want to talk about what does it look like for the next thing for our church. Because I've been going through this process myself. And I, again, I know that some of you may be new and you may be investigating journey. It's a great day for you to be here. But for everybody who calls this place home, I, I think it's important for us to give, for me to give you some next steps. At the er, uh, first part of this year in January, I really felt impressed by God that I needed to go away for an extended period of time and seek him for what was next for our church. Uh, for, for all of these years, 17 and a half years, I've, I've had, this, had this process of just asking God, seeking God for the next thing for us to do. It's part of my role here as the shepherd, as the lead pastor of our church, to look out over the horizon and say, God, where to now? Because God's moving and he, he calls us to follow him. So in other words, it, I, I went away and I, I, I went to Florida um, and went to the beach and spent a bunch of time down there writing and seeking God and praying. My wife and I walked a lot and just talked about our future and talked about the future of our church. Walked over 100 plus miles together. And I'm writing my first book, um, which is really, really hard, really challenging. You would think since I talk for a living, I could maybe put that into words in a book. It's very challenging. But I'm writing it for our church. It'll come out in, in, in the next season or so. Uh, and I'm excited about that. But mainly, I was just pulling away from everything to say, God, I need, I need your words. I need to hear you. Because I feel like our church needs fresh words. We need vision to know what to do next. You probably read this verse before, Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. It literally says where there is no prophetic vision or word or direction from God, the people cast off restraint. We go in all different kinds of directions. God wants us to move towards something together. Here's what I know in leading something for now a good long time is that vision leaks. We get distracted. Culture drifts. We just, we forget things. We get spiritual amnesia. We start to forget the things that God has done in the past. We lose track of where he wants us to go in the future. I don't know about you, but like my life often is like, I'm like a bad grocery cart wheel. Do you ever get like, I always get that cart at the store where it's just like, we're just like, okay. And I'm just doing this number the whole time, walking around whatever store I'm in. But I feel like my life is like that. So there needs to be moments in a church where we go, okay, let's steer back on course. Let's get aligned to where God wants us to go. But before we can do that, we need to talk about where we are. Well, you know, when you put a di a directions in your maps, Apple Maps, Google Maps, whatever, and, and you say, I want to go here, the first thing you have to do is what, say, here's, here's where I am currently. So I want us to celebrate for a moment, like, where we, where we are. And there's this concept in the Old Testament called the Ebenezer, and Ebenezer just simply means stone of help. And what would happen is that pastors, leaders of the community, uh, prophets, many times they would... They would take these giant stones and they would build this altar and each of these stones representing the kinds of things that God had done in their past. The best predictor of God's behavior in the future is God's faithfulness in the past. So we stop and we remember. I don't know about you, I'm living in the future a lot and I, I fail to stop and celebrate. I fail to stop and look around and go, look at what the Lord has done. I just, hey, that was great and then move on. But I think it's an important spiritual discipline to stop and reflect on what God has done in your life personally, in your family, and, and in this church. So here's one of those occasions in 1 Samuel 7, 12. It says, Samuel the prophet, he took a large stone and he placed it between the towns of Mizpah and Shin. And he named it Ebenezer, which means the stone of help. And this is why he says, for, for he said, up to this point, the Lord has helped us. Up to this point, God has done so many amazing things in the life of our church. So much has happened at Journey in the last year. Like so many amazing stories of people's lives being changed. 
Now, Journey has grown dramatically numerically in the last year, like 42%. That's a lot, a lot of people, like between 500 and 800 more people per Sunday every week over the same Sunday of the last year. That's incredible. All of our kids' ministry and our, our middle school and high school and young adults, everything up and to the right, so many more people. Sometimes people say, well, you know, it's not, it's not all about the numbers, Scotty. And I'm like, you're right. It's, it's not. It's about spiritual growth and it's about depth. It's about us taking our steps. But come on, can I just say, like unashamedly, sometimes it is about the numbers because the numbers represent people. Real people with real stories, people that matter to God, every single one of you. And so, and by the way, there, there's lots of numbers in the Bible. Like God is into numbers. Like you, how many disciples were there? Just help me out. Okay, we need to read the Bible more. How many <laughs> disciples in the Bible? Okay, how many, tw- how, many, uh, how many people were fed by the little boy who brought his fish and loaves? You know this? 5,000, okay? Three days in the tomb. And then Peter preaches the first sermon ever. Do you know how many people became Christians that day? 3,000 people. You know, there's a book in the Bible called, wait for it, Numbers. (laughs) Yeah. Because they represent people. In the last year, so many things have happened. We, this, uh, this building here, we, last, uh, this Sunday last year was our first public service in this new space here at Castle Pines. Overflow on the first day. Then uh, we had a grand opening. Even more people came on that Sunday in uh, September. More people have become Christians and been baptized at our church in the history of our church in one year. Just amazing. So many people taking those first steps. More people than ever have gone through crash course, found their way into a role here at Journey, found their purpose, serving in different ways. Our Highlands Ranch location continue to grow. You probably know, but just if you don't, we, we've, we've paused meeting in Highlands Ranch. We're regrouping and we're relaunching into a better facility. I'll tell you more about that in, in a few moments. In February, we launched our Parker location. Hundreds of people attending our Parker location. Even today, kids everywhere. You guys are having some babies around this place, okay? <laughs> 20 babies in the nursery in the zero to... T- probably not zero. We don't take them at zero, but <laughs> young babies to 20, like to two years old, 20 in one classroom this morning. VBS was our vacation Bible school, largest one we've ever had, best one any church has ever had. Middle school ministry, just hundreds of sixth through eighth graders showing up here every week. Nathan Sell and his team leading Look at these amazing students just pouring our lives into the next generation. This is them on their middle school camp. Look at all that mud. Don't you want to be there? Uh, Faces painted. Just an amazing time there. More high school students than ever are attending Journey right now. These these are some of their high school uh, camps that they've been going to. Amazing kids that we're just pouring into their lives. Right here, we're uh, stacking pancakes on somebody's head, which is amazing and so much fun. This was confetti night and some big deal we had. There's still confetti falling out of the ceiling from what they've got going on. This is one of their winter camps. Hundreds of high school students involved, but this is what it's really all about. Look at these two adults pouring their life into these young men. That's what we do. We're investing in the next generation. We started a young adults ministry uh, this past semester. Uh, over 100 young adults are attending regularly a couple times a month. Uh, Wade Smith leading that group, inviting them, teaching the Bible, but also helping them navigate this important season of life. You know that we serve in all different kinds of ways here at Journey. It's not just about what's happening in the building. It's about what's happening outside, being the hands and feet of Jesus. We have amazing things like Christmas store, but we just did our serve day where we, we mobilize hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people to serve in these projects all around our community. Hairnets, everybody. Come on, hairnets. We love some hairnets. And then I, I got wrecked looking at this picture this week. Like, look at these little guys. These guys weren't born when we started doing our first serve days. And now some of their earliest memories will be serving people. Like, you just... That, talk about core memories, parents, like building that into the lives of kids. 
I love also that you can kind of see personalities develop at a very young age. I feel like this young lady right here is in charge. Do you feel like that? <laughs> I don't know whose daughter that is, but she's like looking at it like, I don't know if you're doing the right thing. Let me make sure. This little boy's trying to see if there's something he can take home with him. And so, <laughs> just kidding. Look at her. She's a servant, man. She's got three or four of those things. God, God is at work. God is building his church, not just at Journey, of course. Like every pastor, like I have lots of pastor friends. Every pastor that I know who's teaching the Bible and calling people into a relationship with God, their churches are filled just like this. Why? Because the world is crazy right now. And people are so hungry for something that's certain, something that's true, something I can build my life on. And churches all around the world, despite what your news feed says, the church is alive and thriving and growing because people are hungry. So where are we going? It would be easy to go, isn't this nice? Isn't this wonderful? But if your church is called Journey, you just keep taking steps. Like that's what we do. And as long as there's one more person trying to find their way home, we're going to be busy about it. As long as there's one more person who's trying to find their way back to God, we're going to keep thinking about how do we take a next step. I, I was reading this passage of Scripture while I was away, and I just kept rereading it. I was arrested by it. Like, sometimes if you've been following Jesus for a while, you'll open the Bible and you'll read it, and it's like God read your mail, and he's like, I want to say something directly to you. And I was reading through Isaiah, and in this chapter, it's about God bringing people back to him. They have been sent off to captivity in Babylon, and their shame and brokenness, but God is restoring. There's something in, ooh, in the atmosphere where God is calling people back to himself. And he says to those, those remnant, those leaders, people like you and me, he says, I want you to enlarge the place of your tent. What is a tent? Tent's a place where we live, a place where we dwell, a place where we can all gather. He says, I want you to enlarge the place. I want you to stretch your tent curtains wide. And then these four words, do not hold back. Do not hold back. Spare no expense. Give everything you have. And he says, I want you to lengthen your cords. Now, what are that? That's, that's so you can open the tent wider. And I want you to strengthen your stakes. Now, that requires some work, right? They didn't roll down to Home Depot and pull off a little more rope off the spool, right? They've got to make the rope. There's some work involved. There. They, and they've got, to, they've got to drive some stakes in the ground so it holds and, and so it's steady. And they've got to have some rootedness and some foundation. So there's two things happening there. Enlarge and get rooted. He says, so I want you to spread out to your right and to your left I want, you to, I want you to know that your descendants are going to go out into the world and they're going to rebuild things. It's not just about what's happening here. It's about what God wants to do through the lives of people that he touches in these spaces and places. So I want to tell you about just a couple of things that we're headed into the fall. One is our friend day. When you came in today, you received a, a little uh, invitation. It's on your, uh, should have been on your chair. It's a little square. It looks something like this. It says life on one side. On the back, it's got some service times. Every year at Journey, the weekend after Labor Day, we do something special called Friend Day. And Friend Day is just a simple idea that we would invite one person with us to church. Somebody in your friend group, somebody in your family, somebody in your neighborhood, somebody that you work with, that you would say, hey, we're having a special day at church. I'd love for you to come and be my guest. You can come and sit with me. I'll save you a seat. And so we'd love for you to come. Now, I believe in this so much because the power of an invitation is it's unbelievable. A, a young girl invited me to come to church when I was in high school in my English class. I went to church, and you're all sitting in this room because she invited me. One invitation a thousand years ago when I was young and had black hair and said, would you go? And I said, yeah, and that changed everything. Your invitation could change somebody's life. On that weekend, we'll, we'll launch a, a new teaching series called The Life Project. It's all about life, how, how to follow Jesus in a very simple 
play coming in September. In addition to that, I'm so excited about this. Um, we're going to start that series. We're going to encourage people to attend this five-week series. But then our, our team here at Journey has put together this unbelievable personal guide, written all the content, put it together for every single one of you to have one of these, just a personal guide to, to draw you in and help you grow spiritually, a spiritual growth campaign. And then we're going to encourage every single person from babies all the way up to attend the series, go through the personal guide, and join a group this fall to get connected and walk through this together. I think it's going to be life-changing for, for our church. Now, you may be looking around here, especially at Castle Pines, and going, well, where would those friends sit? <laughs> so we've got to make a little bit more room, right? So uh, one of the things that we're going to do is that we're going to start a Thursday service, a Thursday night service. We're going to add a service to our week. So this Thursday night service is going to start on September the 5th. It's going to be at 6.30 p.m., and so I think this is going to be a great service if you have to work on the weekends, if you travel, if your kids are in sports and you can't make the weekend. And here's what we're saying. Listen, the weekend starts on Thursday. So it's an identical service. I'll be teaching when I'm teaching or whoever else is teaching, they'll be teaching on that. And they teach the whole weekend. So I'll be teaching live every Thursday that I'm here. And so it's the same worship, same kids ministry, just at 630 on a Thursday evening. Hey, Thursday is the new Sunday, everybody, okay? So that'll be fun. So pray about that becoming your service if it fits with your schedule. Also, this is exciting. We're starting a second service at Parker, everybody. So way to go, Parker. So they're, they've grown and they need to make room for more and they're making some different time slots. So th that's going to start on Sunday, September the 8th, the Sunday after Labor Day. Those services are going to be at 930 and 11. So Friend Day will launch that weekend on that Thursday night. You can invite your friends to come on Thursday or that Sunday. We'll have six services to choose from and two different locations. And then for our Highlands Ranch location, we're searching for permanent space. We are in the middle of some last minute negotiations for some permanent space. There are some meetings this week. They've been delayed a little bit because they're doing some stuff with the county, uh, excuse me, with the city. And so they're working through some of their zoning issues. And so we're negotiating for that. And as soon as I have that information, I'm going to share that with you. So we'll have three locations for us to gather as a church. So here's what I'm saying. The next thing for Journey is a lot of the same thing. The next thing for Journey is how can we make just a little bit more room for more? Why? Because we, we love God and we love people. We want more people to know the God that we know. Now, it's not just growth for growth's sake. It just we're not just a nonprofit that's trying to stretch our wings and grow a little bit more. Listen, there's an important reason why and this is why we, we've got to know this. When we lose our why, we lose our way. We get off course. So we have to come back to the why. Like, why are we doing this? So I want to read just a handful of scriptures to close today. In Luke chapter 19, this is one of my favorite stories. I think it's a story really a lot about our community. In Luke chapter 19, verse number one, it says this, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. Now, if you grew up in church, you probably sang a little song about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. And if you didn't grow up in church, you're like, that's weird. <laughs> and offensive. It's really offensive to Zacchaeus. He's a man, and we're calling him wee. Wee little. Anyway, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, though, this is why, like, when we sing songs, like, it, it downplays the power of the story, really. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. Now, what does that tell us? A couple of things. A chief tax collector meant that he worked for the Roman Empire, which means he's a traitor to his people, to his religion, to his government. People hated him. He was ostracized. He had shame on his life, but he was very successful. He was wealthy. On the outside, it looks like he has everything going for him. But on the inside as we'll see, he's searching. Does that remind you a little bit of our community? So he, he wanted to see who Jesus was. He's spiritually curious, but because he was short, that's where we get the wee little man, 
he, he could not see over the crowd. And I've found that so many times people are trying to see Jesus, but his followers often get in the way. The crowd gets in the way. I'd love to follow Jesus, but I've met too many of his followers. But he doesn't let that stop him. He runs ahead and he climbs a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now, children run and climb trees, but not wealthy, older businessmen. That was, undis- that was uh, undignified. But he's not letting that stop him. He's like, hey, I have, I've reached the point in my life where I'm not, I'm not in, I, I, want, I want to get to the truth. And so he climbs the tree. And then there, Jesus is walking by. And when he reached the spot, Jesus looked up. Why does Jesus see him in the tree? Because he's looking for him. Jesus is always on a mission looking for people. And he looks up and he sees this guy, Zacchaeus. Probably everybody in this community would know him. He was a well-known man because every time you pay taxes, you saw him or someone from his organization. And he said, Zacchaeus, I want you to come down immediately and I'm going to stay at your house today. So he came down and he welcomed him and they went to his house. Now, this is an odd exchange. You don't normally invite someone to your house or invite yourself to someone's house, I should say. Like, hey, I'm coming to your house. But it would have been impossible for Zacchaeus to invite him. It, it's really hard to describe what a social faux pas this would be. It's really hard to, to describe what it would mean for Jesus to go to this man's house. He was considered unclean. He was, he was ostracized, pushed to the side. Just, yeah, not one of us. But Jesus looked at him and said, I'm coming to your place. I'm coming to your house. At this All the people saw this and they began to mutter. You know what mutter is? You know what mutter is? How many of you have a teenage daughter? Okay, you know what mutter is. You know what it is. He has gone to the house of a sinner. But listen, look at me. Jesus does not care what people think about him. He is... is, willing to have his reputation tarnished because he cares more about Zacchaeus than he cares what these people think about him. He says, I'm going to your house. He gets there. They begin to have dinner. Zacchaeus, he stands up at the dinner and says, Lord, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. What is that? It's an act of repentance because a chief tax collector extorted money. He stole like dishonest gain. And he says, I've done some things wrong, and I want to make amends for that. Now, why, after, well, there's no evidence that Jesus is preaching to him or telling, he's got in proximity to Jesus. He's got into the presence of Jesus. And the kindness and grace of God leads him to this place where he wants to change. Jesus is bringing honor to this man's house who has been shamed. We want to shame people into honor. Jesus says, no, no, I'll just come and I'll, I'll be around you, and then you'll, Yeah. That's the kind of place that we want to be. We want to be a a place that says, hey, the doors are wide open. We want to invite you in, into the presence of Jesus. And his kindness and his grace lead us to repentance. He says, if I have cheated anybody, I'll pay back four times more. I love this next verse. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man, this man too, is a son of Abraham. You tried to push him to the side, but he's one of mine. And I want him home. Why? Because the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Jesus says, this is why I'm here. This is, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, it's the sick. I, I'm here to find people who realize they need help. So as long as there's one more person, one more person who's trying to find his way home, we're going to be about joining Jesus on this mission at Journey Church. That's, that's who we are. We want to care about people who are trying to find their way back. Why? Because people are the point. We love God. We love people. Everything we do is to try to introduce people to the Savior that we have met so that we can make room for one more. The next thing for Journey is the simple thing. It's a lot of the same things, but it's also just... Some, some small things. How, how could you be part of that? Well, I, you might be asking the question. I'm sure you are because you're just leaned in, ready to go. 
What can I do? Well, you can pray. You can pray that God would be at work, continue to be at work in our church, in our community. You can invite. You can begin praying right now. God, who would you like for me to invite on friend day? You can make Thursday night your service. Do you know why? Like, here's the why. is because if 300 of us who attend Castle Pines on Sunday morning would say, you know what? We're going to make Thursday night our service. That frees up seats for people who are normally coming back to church or being invited by a friend. They're going to come on Sunday. And so you can be, you can partner together with other people to make room for more. You can try Parker. Parker is an exciting, growing congregation. And if you live in the Parker area, I'm asking you, take a step, go try it out. It's, it's journey in a different place. You're, you're going to love it. You can give. You can serve. All different kinds of places are opening up because we're starting new services, because we need people to step into roles to help. So I want to lead us in a prayer as we close today. I, I wrote this, um, I wrote this, or ca actually came back to it because I wrote it a while ago. I came back to it over these, the time that I was away, and I, I, and I prayed it every day. And I, I want to invite you to be in to pray it. And we're going to bring it back for the next couple of weeks. And it's true for our lives personally. It's true with our families. It's true with our church. This simple prayer. I'm going to read it. If you maybe want to just follow along and pray it with me, if it's your desire, then, then do that. Lord, I'm all yours. Completely. I'll go where you tell me to go. I'll do what you tell me to do. I surrender, Lord. And I'm listening. Here, here am I. Send me. I, I'm, I'm hoping that our church, you know, if 10 people in our church started praying this, it'd change a lot. It, it might change our whole community. But if all of us just laid our lives out there and said, God, I don't know what the next thing is, but I know it's with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold up my light. I'm going to get close to your presence. I'm going to draw into your word. I'm going to try to follow your path. And I'm just going to take my next step. And then you're going to illuminate the next step and the next step. We wind up where God wants us to be. We wind up where we need to be. Let's pray together. So would you right now just, if you call this place home, just say, God, what's my part? What do you want me to do? How can I be involved? How can I serve? Maybe you're here today and you would say, you know what I need more than anything is I need a relationship with God. I need to start following Jesus. I need to surrender my life to him. I need to renew my faith. If that's you, why don't you pray a simple prayer, something like this. God, I need you. I believe in your son, Jesus. I believe he lived for me and died on a cross for my sin and rose from the grave. The best way I know how, I surrender my life to you. I'm asking you to forgive me of everything I've done wrong and, and set me on a new path. and Help me start following you today. In Jesus' name, amen.